Welcome to episode 322 of The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. Today's episode is all about learning how to subtract with Lighty Clots. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to The Brainy Business Podcast, where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain-friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. Today's episode is all about the power of subtraction with Dr. Lighty Klotz. And no, we aren't talking about math per se, more of a less is more vibe and approach to life and business. Lighty was so wonderful to talk to. And as you're going to hear in this episode, which first aired in 2021, My husband and I talk about minimizing and reducing and downsizing and all that a lot. So I think about and refer to this episode and Lighty's book, Subtract, all the time. I think this episode dovetails really nicely with the recent conversation I had with Vanessa Patrick about her book, The Power of Saying No, as well as my conversation last week with Kate Gigax about transitioning to act two in life where you need to find ways to say no to more stuff so you can say yes to what matters. And of course, I'm refreshing this episode today because of how it leads into this coming Friday's episode with Marcy Rader author of Work Well, Play More. She's all about helping people achieve productive, healthy, clutter-free living one step at a time. There's a lot of subtraction in there. And Marcy mentioned a book on her journey that reminded me a lot of this conversation with Lighty, so I knew it was the perfect one to refresh today. As you listen to the episode, think about the areas in your life where you could use a little optimization, reduction, efficiency, less stress, and everything like that. Try to focus on the areas of productivity, clutter, and health so you are all set and ready for that conversation with Marcy coming out on Friday. And if you aren't yet subscribed to the Brainy Business Podcast, now's a good time to hit that subscribe button to be sure you don't miss that one or any other episode. Don't forget, there are links for everything, including past episodes, books, like Subtract, as well as Work Well, Play More, and articles all waiting for you in the show notes for this episode, which are found within the app you're listening to and at thebrainybusiness.com slash 322. All right, let's talk about the power of subtracting. Dr. Lighty Klotz, welcome to the Brainy Business Podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. (laughs) I feel like I always throw people off, but I like to say, doctor, if you have a PhD, you have earned this (laughs) at least once that I want to say it when we go into the show. But I think then people go, oh, yeah, I guess I am a doctor. That's weird. <laughs> people don't usually say that. But that is exactly what threw me off. Yeah, I we could just tell. Spent, How do you pronounce your name? And then, then you hit me with doctor. <laughs> yeah. I know. Boom. That's you. Well, let's jump right in. I want you to tell the audience a little bit about you. I We were talking about in kind of our pre- chat about your background, which is not, well, there isn't really, I think, a common path to behavioral science yet. Yours is one of the less common paths. So uh, tell a little bit about your background and how you got to behavioral science. Sure. And I, it's it's interesting. I mean, I do think of myself as working with behavioral science, but it's funny when people refer to me as a behavioral scientist, because I'm not sure if I've made that leap yet. But um, all of my training is in engineering. Um, so I was a civil engineering as an undergraduate, and then architectural engineering is what I did my PhD in. And basically, you know, kind of all the engineering that goes into how we create buildings and, and cities and things like that. And uh I'd always been motivated in doing that work to figure out how we could do this in a more sustainable way. So ways that, you know, produce fewer (laughs) carbon emissions and um, ways that are more socially just and and things like that. And there was just seemed to be this huge gap between like the technology that was available or the the building techniques that were available and what was actually happening um, and what was actually being designed. And that's when I started to get interested in like, okay, well, what is it about like 
engineering design and then just design more broadly, you know, defined as how we change things from how they are to how we want them to be. What is it about that design process that's like preventing us from realizing these more sustainable outcomes? So that's what led me to behavioral science. And it's just been a, a really, a really fun ride since. Yeah. Well, and I mean, where you mentioned architecture and within the field of behavioral science and economics, of course, choice architecture, if anybody was to say that there's not a tie, you know, sorry, <laughs> it's, you know, our Nobel, one of our big Nobel winning concepts is based on the way that you structure choices and present information to people. And you use that example of the path that people will take depends on where you place the elevator or where the buttons are. And you have to be thoughtful about all those little tidbits and the human behavior and making sure, you know, where are people going to cut across the lobby versus not? Or again, if you're going to take this weird route because of the median that's been put in the road or whatever, you know, all the, you're talking about like city designs and things that you have to think about. There's the way that people should go and then what they will actually do, which ties exactly into what we talk about in behavioral science. Yeah, that's totally accurate. And it's interesting. I saw a piece that uh, Richard Deller had written and he, you know, obviously one of the coiners of the term choice architecture and one of the Nobel laureates. And um, he was talking about it's time to kind of extend that analogy to get from the choice architecture. I think he said into like the plumbing and into the, um, so basically how do you kind of continue and, you know, continuing with this engineering analogy. And I think you know, the other way it's it's apt is when you're talking about how we design these pathways, but also talking about how we're applying science, right? Um, and so engineering is the creative application of science, you know, most that's the broad definition of it. And so those of us, you know, like like you and like like your listeners who are applying behavioral science are in many ways, you know, engineering, probably not in the traditional sense of it but in terms of that basic definition of creatively applying science i think that the there's a there's a huge overlap there too with um between engineering and behavioral science and architecture design for sure yeah and as we know from when katie milkman was on the show we were talking about this in the intro too that her background is in engineering so perhaps it will not be an uncommon route to behavioral sciences. I know for me, having a marketing background is one that can be seen as being strange as well to, or, you know, that I went to school for business and then, you know, jumped in on the getting my master's in behavioral economics. And people think what, like that marketing, that's not the same thing, but it's so applicable to me. And so I love where people will contact from around the world and they have these just so such a diverse background and are finding uses for behavioral science. I just, I love that. I think it's so, so useful. One of my best collaborators is Eric Johnson at Columbia, and he has a book coming out, so you should interview him for your podcast, but he knows just more than okay. anybody about choice, basically. And uh, so <laughs> when we talk about choice architecture, he's like, people have been doing choice architecture for a long time. It's just been called marketing. So he, <laughs> so I think there's like a really natural yeah. overlap <laughs> in some ways um, between marketing and and behavioral science. But um, that's so it's interesting to hear you say that, you know, that's not not what people are always think. Yeah. I think it depends on if you're on the academic side or on the applied side. That's true. Yeah. Academia, we like to draw boundaries and put people in boxes. <laughs> Say, what are you again? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, definitely um, want to also touch on a very interesting piece of your background that I don't know if you get to talk about that much anymore, but uh, you were a professional soccer player and you wrote a book about sustainability through soccer. Can you tell a little bit about how maybe your background in sports has tied in with the work you do in behavioral science? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if it's tied in any. I, I think, it, you know, sport playing soccer was like my focus for the first 20 years of my life. So I, I omitted that from when you asked for my background. And then the sustainability through soccer book was an attempt to um, kind of describe some of these systems level concepts. So the ways that, well, systems thinking is this really key idea for sustainability, right? So how things are related, how, you know, if you move one thing, it, it changes things in other places. 
And so I think that was that book. And soccer is very kind of systems oriented sport, right? So if you think about sports like, you know, baseball or football, they're broken into these discrete plays, right? And you can say, okay, well, that play happened. And then the next play happened. Well, soccer, it's like, it's just free flowing the whole time. And it's, um, so that's, that was the point of the analogy, you know, seeing, basically seeing this idea of sustainability and systems thinking through, through soccer analogies. I would say though, that the, I mean, the, the teamwork, um, the research that was the basis of my book and, you know, by far the best research I've ever been a part of was just an example of like an incredibly high performing team. And I think that the, the lessons learned from, from, playing sports um, and and how to work together certainly carry over into that environment. I also think a little bit of the, you know, kind of being willing to um, go across disciplinary boundaries might come from sports, right? It's like you realize that there's other ways of of learning things in the world outside of just your your major, right? I learned a lot of things by, by playing soccer. And um, so I can learn a lot of things by learning more about behavioral science, even though I'm technically an engineer by training. So I think those are a couple of the ways that it, that it's probably, probably carried over after, you know, distracting me for the first 22 years of my life from, (laughs) from doing anything productive. No, no, I, I, there's so much to it. And, um, recently did an episode where uh, Michael Bartlett came on and interviewed me about my book on the show, which is a fun uh, sort of experience (laughs) with that. But he was asking about sports and there are lots of professional, uh, you know, people that played, they got a scholarship and then ended up in the space or whatever it is. And um, different people who've done research on just we were talking about Katie Milkman. So potentially that made me think about Angela Duckworth and grit and how that all comes together and the type of people we are. My background being a classically trained opera singer, I think is very valuable with the type of work that I do now. And others might think that that is super weird, but (laughs) it all comes together in my own mind. And that's all that matters. So, I mean, there's no question to me with the, with the discipline, sorry to interrupt, but I can go on forever with sports and, um, and uh, like, yeah. And so, do you know, Indre Viscontis, she's a podcast host too. She does uh, inquiring minds, but she's a, I forget if it's opera or like classical music and trained in that area. And then um, I was, uh, Adam Grant does his book lists and I got, I got selected for the summer. I was all excited. And I looked at the other books that got selected and there was one by John Amici. And I was like, I know a guy named John Amici, but I knew him from his, his basketball career. And now he's like an, an organizational psychology professor, I think, and also writing books. So, so yeah, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of overlap between those things. And I think it's, uh, I think it's really fun to see the things that people do outside of the, outside of the time that, you kind of know them for. Yeah. Well, and learning those little bits to where we can kind of understand what's going on, what makes us who we are and how we might approach a problem differently than somebody else. And that that is all very valuable to know of which one also congratulations for making Adam Grant's book list. That's a big deal. So hooray. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Congratulations. And so great segue. Let's talk about your book. <laughs> so what uh, what inspired your book is called Subtract. And so tell a little bit about how you got there <laughs> from all of what we've been talking about here so far. Yeah, from all of what we that's great. I get to segue into it differently than I normally do. But I'll, I'll also give the the fun segue too. But um, from what we've been talking about before, it's like, so I talked about engineering, right? And being interested in the science of design, how, how we change things from how they are to how we want them to be. And then also being interested in sustainability, right? Like, why are we overshooting the these planetary boundaries, whether it's, you know, the amount of emissions in the atmosphere or some, you know, the freshwater stores. And so I think it's, the book arose from asking this, what I consider maybe the most basic applied question, right? It's like when we try to change things from how they are to how we want them to be, that's the applied part, right? What's, what's the first thing that we think of? And I, I'd always been interested in kind of less and minimalism and, you know, not as a practicing minimalist or anything, but just as, okay, how does, how does this happen? How, why don't, why isn't this more, common? Why does it seem like we're always adding across all these other areas? But the the real, you know, 
tipping point in in my thinking about it actually came by playing Legos with my son, who was um, three at the time, and we were making a a Lego bridge, and it was not level, so one of the columns was shorter than the other column, and uh, so I tried to solve the problem, right? Tried to change the situation from how it was to how I wanted it to be. So I turned around behind me to get another block to add to the shorter column. And by the time I had turned back around, Ezra, my son, had removed a block from the longer column. And I was like, that's it. That's it. That's what's that's what I'm thinking about, right? Is that, you know, when we encounter these situations that we can improve in in multiple ways in the two most basic ways are adding something to it or taking something away from it. Why is our first instinct to add? And, um, you know, we've since done, I'm sure, more than 10,000 hours worth of research between me and um, three great behavioral science collaborators here, uh, Gabe Adams, Ben Converse and, and Andy Hales. But it's amazing how <laughs> how closely our our research findings mapped that initial insight. And so we, we studied it across Lego structures, not, not Ezra's Lego structure, but um, different carefully experimentally designed uh, <laughs> Lego structures and, you know, itineraries, recipes. We basically tried to study it across ideas, objects, and situations to show that this is something that happened in a lot of contexts. And perhaps the most convincing study is um, we, we created these grids on a computer screen. So it's, um, a pattern of squares arranged in a in a grid and there are four basic four quadrants in this grid pattern and the task was to make the the quadrants symmetrical from top to bottom and side to side and we put extraneous blocks in one of the quadrants and um so to solve this task you could either remove blocks from one quadrant or you could add blocks to all three quadrants and people overwhelmingly added so anyway, the long story short with that research that was published on the cover of Nature a week before the um, <laughs> a week before my book came out, which I'm not someone who has any other articles published in Nature. So this was like a huge highlight of my career, both happening a week apart and, and both related. But that when people try to improve something, uh, their first thought is to think, what can we add to this situation to make it better? Um, it's, it's what I thought of with the Legos. It's what you tend to think of with trying to improve an itinerary. It's why we don't think to, you know, remove things from our our list of things that we're working on. It's like we jump right to adding to-dos when stop doings might be what we need. So that's where it all started. Um, and I mean, as it ties into the book, that is the the first chapter of the book is like, okay, here's this new insight into why we overlook subtraction. But there's also a lot of reasons why we might think to subtract and then not choose it. Probably a lot of the things that you've already talked to your audience about, you know, like loss aversion, the endowment effect, and um, the Ikea effect, all these reasons why adding might be preferred, even when you do think of subtraction. And so the book goes on to explore like, okay, why else is this happening? We're biological, cultural, economic forces you know, helping um, cause this oversight of subtraction. And then, you know, the, the latter half of the book gets into, well, what, what can we do about it? Now that we know this science um, and the science is all kind of in one place and has a coherent thread through it, what are the science informed things that we can do to, to get better at taking away? Does that make sense? That was a, that <laughs> might be more than you, more than you bargained for, but you asked how I came to it and that that's it. I love it. No, it's, it's, I'm a fan too of the story behind the book and the story or the research or, or whatever that is. I think there's a lot of value in that. And that piece of, like you said, that we do have, I know one of the you know chapters is called adding instincts. And like you said, that we, we do just jump to add stuff and there's no real good reason uh, other than like you said we're loss averse and you just want all your but we don't even think to get rid of something more often than not and so in this way not to say the only reason that you are here because i had seen you in some other stuff too so my husband has been i don't think i've talked about this really on the show yet so we'll see but my husband has been on a minimalist train for quite some time now. It it had started pre-pandemic 
time. And then through this, I mean, there's been a lot of culling in our world, (laughs) which is fine. But it's interesting as he's been doing all this research. And like you said, he does not, he's not a minimalist in the truest sense of, uh, you know, you have one chair and um, one fork or whatever. (laughs) Some get very extreme of which, you know, I was looking at some of the videos like that just looks like a depressing and sad life versus there's got to be some balance here where it's not just this like art of nothingness is not the same. And so he has been doing a lot of research on that minimal space and also essentialism and which for me, essentialism is very close to, I'm a big fan of when it came out and I still like the life-changing magic of tidying up, which it be, it's become cliche a little bit now, perhaps because of her Netflix show or, or whatever it is, but that just even the, you know, does this spark joy? And when I do mindset work with people, I talk about this, um, you know, is this going to help me reach my goal type of a quest? Same thing. Is this actually something that's helping me get there or not? And if it's not, then don't do it. <laughs> and I like, like you said, of the instead of a, a longer list of to do's, we need a list of stop doings. And so, which I think is a great way to phrase that, but to get rid of all this excess, do you have any insight into, can you tell a little bit more about why we feel inclined to do more and why it may sort of instinctively feel bad to have less? I find with people, there's something that feels really good to have 10 things say on your to-do list when you will never get them done. And when I tell people that you should have, if you have just one thing on your have to-do list each day and you have a goal you're working toward, you know, you'll get there in the end. Whereas if you have 10 things and you only get three done, you feel terrible and it creates this really vicious cycle. And then you have to add seven more things to tomorrow's to-do list and they're never going to get done. And you're in this constant state of feeling bad. Whereas if you only have one thing on your to-do list and you get it done plus two more, you feel amazing. It could be the same three things, but resetting that anchor, reframing a little bit can just totally change everything. I don't know that you have anything specifically about that, but that's how I talk about it. And then whatever thoughts you have to build on. Yeah. I I mean, directly to that question, I think, um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is this desire to display competence that we have. And this is a, a fundamental need for, for living things, you know, humans in particular, but, um, or as we're talking about them now, but and, you know, so, so what that looks like is, um, I, I, the, one of the stories I use in the book is bower birds. They're the, the birds that build these ceremonial nests, right? And the whole purpose of these nests is to attract a mate, but it's really, you know, wh- why is a nest attracting a mate? And it's not that they're using it for shelter because even after the, the mating happens, the woman goes off and the female bower bird goes off and builds a, a nest that provides shelter. So all this nest is doing is showing that the, the bird that built it is capable and can deal with the world. And um, we all kind of share that we, as humans, we want to display our competence too, right? And maybe it's not building nests or, you know, houses, although there is probably some element of that there. Um, and, or just my, my son playing with Legos, right? I mean, part of the reasons he likes to do that is because it's showing that he can, he can do things, he can make these things. And so you say, well, okay, well, why does, why does competence come from adding as opposed to subtracting? I mean, theoretically, by taking things away, you could show your competence in the world. And I think that actually ties nicely back into the, the condo example, right? It's, um, I had to read the condo stuff because I was going around talking about our research and people said, well, this is like Marie Kondo. <laughs> I better, I knew who she was, but I'd never read her book. I was like, I better go read her book. And, and some of the advice is like pretty sound scientifically, even though she takes a very like spiritual approach to it. But she tells people, you know, one of the novel things about her method, I think, is that, hey, declutter completely, right? It's not like, oh, take one thing away every day for the next, you know, year, and then your house will be clean after a year. It's like, no, do this all in one weekend, and you'll notice a difference, right? So she's helping people display competence 
through subtracting. Because if I just picked up, I'm looking at around my office right now and my um, son who's now six will come in here and mess things up. And if I just pick up one thing, like my wife is not going to notice my competence at picking up. Um, but if I were to pick up this whole area, I can display competence through subtracting. So tying that back into your example, which I think one of the hardest ways to do this um, is with the kind of work tasks, right? I feel like the the stop doings are, it's much harder to display competence by saying, okay, I'm not going to do this thing. Whereas if you have 10 things on your to-do list, you might not be doing them well, and it might make you feel miserable, but at least you've got 10 things on your to-do list to show, hey, I'm I'm dealing with the world. So I, I think that's a nice example, actually, of how like knowing a little bit more about the science, this this desire for for competence, right? And how that might kind of advantage adding. But but once you know that, you can say, okay, well, competence doesn't mean we can also show competence by subtracting. We just have to um might have to do more of it so that it's noticeable. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, like tying that your, your tip to have them do one thing is actually probably pretty, pretty good along those lines, right? Because if you just have one thing on your to-do list, that's kind of, that's noticeable, right? That's a little radical where you just like, oh, look at, look at Melina. She's only got one thing on her to-do list. She must be like, you know, one of these like avant-garde thinkers who can really, um, uh, so I think that that's an example of kind of noticeable less that allows you to display, allows you to display competence. Yeah. Well, and in the, the way I, I set that up is, and I'll, I'll link to the episode, at least I, I think I talked about this on multiple episodes, but I'll link to those in the show notes for everybody who's interested on. So you have to, you have to find your goal. And so if you say like this year, the most important thing for me to do in my business is to write a book, right? Or, you know, and there's a lot of things that have, to happen to be able to write a book as we both know. And if that is my number one priority and I sit down in advance and say, when I look at my business and my life and my career, like this is number one. And there's a lot of other stuff that could be a really great distraction, some nice bike shedding techniques for me along the way. And I don't want to let them distract me. So then I sit down and I know that writing the book is so important. And to say like, these are all the things I need to do over the next 90 days to get this book moving. And I think out 90 different things and I assign one per day. And then by the end, I'm going to have my book done, you know, something along those lines to where, yes, I still have to answer emails. Yes. I still have to teach classes. <laughs> yes. I still have consulting work, but on this one thing that really matters that I need to want to be able to look back at the end of the year and say, I did it. I, I made it. The book exists now. If you don't prioritize it from the get go and do, you know, a little bit at a time, sort of tortoise in the hare world, you know, it just probably won't get done. And you'll look back and say, man, I did a lot of busy work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's, I mean, the, the challenge there too, that's where the stop doings come in, right? It's like the, at some point, um, you're, it becomes impossible to juggle your consulting and your classes and your, um, and your emails and the book. Right. And so it's, it's not a matter anymore of, okay, just saying no to, to more things that are coming in. It's a matter of actually stopping stuff that you're, you're already doing. And I mean, that, that's a really, that's a, that's an insight that's in good to great Jim Collins's book, but it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an example of this need to take stuff away. Um, and I also think it ties back into your, you know, maybe the, the, definitely the difference here between minimalism and some of these other philosophies that can also be achieved by not doing anything. Right. It's like, if you can, you can be a minimalist by just not acquiring stuff. And I'm not saying that's, that's bad. I'm just saying that's not subtracting, right? <laughs> subtracting is, Oh, you've got all your stuff and now you're, you're going to get rid of it. Or subtracting is you've got your full schedule and now you're going to take some stuff out of it so that you can get the stuff done that you actually want to get done. So what's the, this is the point of like the big tip. Of course we would say, you know, get the book for, <laughs> to really learn some of these things. But for everyone who's listening now and saying, yes, yes, I'm way over committed. I've got myself here now and I know that just not accepting new things isn't going to be enough. How does one start to subtract? Yeah. I mean, I knew, buy, buy the book and read it. And, uh, 
<laughs> or just, <laughs> I don't even care if you buy it. I just, but I, I do like, I purposely wrote the book to one of the reasons I think that we continue to have like the Marie Kondo's, the, the Cal Newports, the essentialism, and this is all useful stuff. It's really useful. And it's, but it's, it's evidence of this kind of underlying problem <laughs> that left to our own devices, we're not going to think of, of taking away. Right. And, you know, this goes all the way back to, um, you know, Da Vinci's idea of design perfection was there's nothing left to take away or Lao Tzu two and a half millennia ago talking about to, to gain wisdom, you have to subtract things every day. So we've had a hard time doing this for a long time. We've always needed people to remind us. Um, I hope that my book kind of by understanding the science um, and, you know, some of the stories in there, like kind of intentionally designed to help rearrange people's mental furniture, where you, you will think about subtraction across contexts that no kind of expert could, could, could prescribe for you, right? Because nobody knows exactly what your situation is, but I think you can kind of go from the science and adapt it to your situation. Um, so I, and that really is the value proposition of the book. And, you know, if you've got the time, that would be the, <laughs> the one thing to do. But um, I think a, a good lesson is to subtract first. If you're going <laughs> to pick one thing, I, I mentioned Eric Johnson before about, you know, who studies a lot about how people make decisions and, um, you know, the, the order is very important, right? I mean, if you subtract first, you're more likely to think about it in in later uh situations and what we've found in our research right is that one of the most basic problems here is that people don't even think of it right so if you are reminding yourself okay subtract first or, or then at least you're gonna think of it which will you know get us over one major hurdle in this quest to use more of our options to make change is that a satisfactory answer? Subtract first, or is that too intuitive? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's it's definitely an important place to start to be on the lookout to know that we have a tendency not to do this, and it's important to do. So, I feel like one of the biggest hurdles that people have here might be as you even if you think about subtracting, but then you know, as they say, nothing. I think this was a Kahneman quote that nothing is as important as you think it is until you're focusing on it. <laughs> <laughs> until you're thinking about it. And then you that's where the loss aversion kicks in. You get some of that counterfactual and prefactual thinking of like, well, I'm going to want this. And I've built up my career of people thinking that I do this one thing. And if it go, I could just leave it in the background because I might want it later. You know, you, you get all this stuff going on in the brain and there's that kind of guilt and regret aversion maybe that's coming up. Do you have any advice on slaying those particular demons. Yeah. I, and that's one of the mindset shifts I think that it could be helpful to make generally, right? Is this, I think there's this tendency to conflate less and loss basically. Right. Um, and, you know, when Kahneman's talking about loss aversion or, or when we're thinking about loss aversion, we're thinking about, okay, this is going to be bad. Right. And then once you think the thing's going to be bad, you weigh it twice as much as you do, you know, kind of the gain, but less is not a loss as we're talking about it here. Right. I mean, the whole premise is like, this is an improvement. <laughs> this is, I, we're talking about, certainly there's cases where less is a loss, but there, we're talking about the cases where taking away is actually going to make things better. And so I think reminding yourself that, you know, okay, this is an easy misunderstanding to have in your own thinking, right. Where it's like, okay, just because I'm not going to have this chair anymore means that's bad. It, it could just be that not having this chair anymore is actually going to make things better. And so that would help kind of get over this idea that that less is always a loss, right? Um, so that's a, one of the, would be a really helpful mindset shift, I think, to make. I think the other one is um, the, the valence. And this goes back to Marie Kondo, but, you know, valence in chemistry is the, you know, attraction in the atoms and the electrons and but in and then in behavioral science right the the valence is how you're you know the the emotion or the the perception around a, an idea or concept right and subtract has a very negative valence um it's it's seen as this bad 
thing. And, you know, so what Marie Kondo does is, you know, emphasizes the spark joy, right? That's arguably the the genius in, in what she's done. It's like getting rid of this is going to spark joy. So she avoids she avoids this negative balance that could potentially be around subtraction. And I think that's a really helpful shift that, that all of us can make. Um, and then the last one, uh, this other kind of mindset shift that I hope the book helps people make is um, we tend to think of add and subtract as like opposites, like choose one and you can't have the other. Right. So I still get people who, when I'm talking about this, they'll be like, well, adding's good sometimes. You're like, of course, adding's good sometimes. And it's probably, you know, most, maybe more, even more of the time adding's better. I'm just saying that it, it's a shame that we don't consider both of them. And I think part of the problem there maybe is that we position them as opposites. And, you know, that's something we naturally do in our reasoning, right? It's like you position two concepts as opposite. And then, you know, if like one, one is true, then the other is not true. And that's helpful except for when the things aren't actually opposites. And as we're talking about them here, they're just complementary ways to make change, right? If So if we started to think like, okay, I added to this situation and it made it better, maybe I should think about subtracting from this situation. That might make it better too, as opposed to, you know, what I think might happen is we think, okay, I, I added to this and it got better. That means that subtracting can't possibly be an option, right? So so the mind, this mindset shift from add or subtract to add and subtract, I think could, could help quite a bit. It would also help with that fundamental oversight that we found in our research, right? Because if you're not thinking of subtraction, but if you're, if then you all of a sudden are thinking add and subtract when you, when you, your first instinct is to add, then maybe subtraction would come to mind more quickly after that. Yeah. Well, as you were just talking there, it was really making me think too of the, the physics of it all right in this, subtracting something means you're adding something else somewhere else, even if you're not considering it. And same, adding something means you're losing something else somewhere. The kind of basic example in this where they say in whether it's life or business to, you know, saying yes to something means you're saying no to everything else. And we don't necessarily think about all the things we're saying no to along that because our, you know, our time is now compromised. I can't do anything else because I said yes to the thing, but it feels like you don't think about all the things you say no to in the same way of when you add something, you know, it's taking away space or it's taking away something to where you couldn't do something else in the future. If you had thought about maybe subtraction in this other way. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I think, and, and, and very true, I think. Um, so that might be a really helpful thing to kind of shift the framing around when you're arguing for subtraction or when you're trying to get people to think of subtraction is like help them think about the thing that they're added elsewhere. And I guess Kondo, you know, back to Kondo, like she, she does that a little bit, right? She has people envision the the clean space that you're going to have. Right. And then that becomes the thing that you're scared of losing. Um, so it kind of flips what the what the loss is, right? So so when she says, "Okay, envision this clean room," and then you fail to declutter, you've you've lost this clean room, and that you know, as we know, like losses loom larger than gains, and so that kind of that's helpful. Um, I also think you know we've talked a lot about these kind of systematic disadvantages for taking away, and I think that you know what you just mentioned is a really systematic advantage for taking away, right? It's like when we add something, we're left with the original situation plus whatever we've added. When we take something away, we're left with an improved original situation plus that thing that we took away, which we can like use somewhere else, right? <laughs> like we can, right. Um, the example that I use in the book is donut holes because um, it took forever to think to subtract the middle from donuts to make them, you know, cook more evenly. And also you can like fit more sugar on them and stuff. But then it's a nice example of like, okay, once you have subtracted, you've got that donut hole left over, right? And you can do something with that. You can you can sell it. Um, it's kind of the example of, you know, if you subtract something from your from your to-do list, then all of a sudden you've got you've got space. Um so so yeah, I, I love that. I'm gonna use it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate for for the guy who who wrote the book on subtracting that I I thought I made a point that helped you think, oh, I didn't think about it that way yet. Right. So I think that's always fun. <laughs> I thought you were going <laughs> to go when yeah. people bring up the physics that like, I talked to some physicists about this as a result of the nature paper, and they're interested in like entropy. 
they say, well, you know, maybe maybe this is like a result of humans being around entropy for so long that, you know, we just kind of the, the natural evolution of things is adding complexity. Um, but anyway, so I thought so I was I, I liked that your physics example went in a slightly different and more practical direction. <laughs> I think the uh, you assume a level of physics knowledge that I do not employ. <laughs> To where I could not have made that particular leap, and I'm going super basics, but I'm glad that it worked out. <laughs> oh uh, no, see. I uh, I knew about it from engineering, and like there was a there's a deleted section of the book that was like trying to make the connection because it's too it's too philosophical, and it's not it, there's no like practical ramification of it. So anyway, oh, all the things that make it to the you know the editing graveyard i guess where it's like no i have to have this in the book and then but if you didn't subtract that out it would have made for i'll say a worse book but i will just <laughs> there's a lot of value that came from pulling something somewhat erroneous that felt important to you but wasn't adding value at the time yeah talk about hard right i mean we talked about this <laughs> desire to show competence and i mean there's no you know when you've written something and then to to take it out, that is a really hard thing. In my own book process, I have a whole Trello board of when I would pull sections that I would copy and like paste it all somewhere to where I knew where it came from. And if something changes and I have to go at it back, I didn't lose it. It's not totally gone. It's just living somewhere else right now. <laughs> and then I have to read it without it and see if it feels like there was something missing. And there never is. It always gets more clear kind of as you go through that process. <laughs> yeah, I have the exact same thing. Well, not exactly the same. It's not a Trello board, but I have an excerpts file. And it's like, that is never going to see the light of day. But it made me feel <laughs> Feel so much better when I was taking stuff out of the book. So it's like, oh, maybe I will use these 40,000. It could be words. an article someday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's just never, never opening it again, probably. Yeah, but you have it, you know, someday you'll delete it and it's not adding value to your life and whatnot. But yeah, it helps you get through the process. Well, Thank you so much for everyone who is super excited about getting the book. Of course, there will be a link in the show notes. Uh, what are other ways if somebody does want to follow you get in touch whatever what what are the best options for that yeah i'm on twitter and linkedin um you can find my email on the internet too so uh and i like i like talking about this stuff so that's been one of the most fun things about about writing the book is getting to kind of expand the network of people who i get to talk about these ideas with like you melina so <laughs> <it's> <laughs> yeah Absolutely. Well, I love it. We will definitely have links to your Twitter, your LinkedIn, to the book. It'll all be there waiting for everyone in the show notes. So thank you so much again for joining me today to talk about the importance of subtracting first and not just following our adding instincts. Great. It's terrific to be here. So what got your brain buzzing as you learned about how to subtract today? For me, I've always loved Lydie's statement that less is not a loss. When we think about loss aversion, my top recommended next episode for you to listen to after this one, and the way we humans approach all our lives and opportunities and all of what we've always done and how hard it can be to let go, it's just so important to remember this and keep it in mind. One recent interview that comes to mind for me where this came up was in my conversation with Scott Miller on The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, where we talk about starting a mentor relationship and potentially being hesitant to do so because of that fear that you might be stuck with this person forever. Why is the default that we start things and they go on in perpetuity and you can never get rid of anything, but you just have to keep adding more and more and more? Let's let go of that, shall we? In addition to that episode with Scott, I've also linked to my other recent episode with Vanessa Patrick discussing her book, The Power of Saying No, to help you identify when to say no and ways to do it better so people don't hate you. <laughs> Very important skills in there, to be sure. And of course, I'm linking to my conversation with Nir Eyal about his book, Indistractable, and how you can eliminate distractions to get more of the right stuff done. And that brings me to this upcoming Friday's episode with Marcy Rader and her book, Work Well, Play More, 
which takes a lot of what I loved about Indistractable and just dials it up like 50 notches. Marcy has broken down habits into three areas, productivity, clutter, and health, and combine them all together in a 12-month approach where you can work to get little improvements in each of them and see massive value and ability to reclaim time and mental well-being and so much more across all areas of your life. It is such a wonderful book, and I can't wait to share our conversation with you this coming Friday. If you aren't already subscribed to the Brainy Business Podcast, take a moment to do so now to be sure you get that episode and every other one right when they come out. And of course, don't forget about the show notes to check out those related past episodes, books like Subtract, Work Well, Play More, Indistractable, and The Power of Saying No, as well as a timestamp summary of the episode and more. It's all waiting for you in the show notes at thebrainybusiness.com slash 322. And just like that, episode 322 on Subtract with Lydie Klotz is done. Join me Friday for a brand new episode with Marcy Rader to discuss her book, Work Well, Play More. It's going to be a lot of fun. You don't want to miss it. Until then, thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain-friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.